Mm-hmm. Manoj, can we start? Yeah. After yeah, I think uh, we can start now mm-hmm. anyway. Okay. Uh, That's wonderful. Uh, it's more than yeah. 90, 90 students. Uh, yeah, 90 participants. Okay. Yeah, anyway, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, we are so happy that uh, Dr. Sarada Natarajan is with us today for a uh, it's a two days lecture series and the first one uh, is on uh, introduction to visual culture and i invite all of you especially dr shatha natarajan uh, i mean she needs no introduction i think because uh, last year exactly i think in Janu- january in, yeah in the last week of january i think yeah she was here for a workshop in our college and uh, students and faculty members are uh, much familiar to her so I'm not uh, going to all this uh, the biodata and any other thing. It has been shared in the groups. So uh, I request students to go through uh, her profile and uh, everything. And uh, a lot of uh, students and alumni are requested to join this uh, webinar. I mean, not webinar, <laughs> this lecture series. But uh, we couldn't admit everyone. Uh, but yeah, people like uh, Shamikda was there. <laughs> he just contacted me in the morning, and then uh, yeah. And also our colleagues from Trivandrum, uh, also a few old students, and uh, even junior students joined uh, for today's uh, talk. It was actually meant for final and third year students. Uh, so a brief introduction about uh, Dr. Sharita Natarajan. She got PhD. Uh, uh, titled Framing Premodern Indian Art, Art and History from MS University of Baroda. And then she did her MA in Art History from the same institution. Uh, also, she has been uh, teaching in uh, Central University of Hyderabad for 14 years. And then uh, for a short period, she was the principal of Chitragala Parishad, Bangalore. And then at present, she is uh, a visiting uh, fellow at uh, Shivnadar University and then Ashoka University in Sonipat. So uh, I hope uh, uh, you know everyone will participate wholeheartedly in this uh, uh, talk. I invite everyone, especially inviting Dr. Sharda Natarajan, on behalf of uh, Government College of Fine Arts, Trishul. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manoj. And it's a wonderful thing to be uh, back with uh, one of the colleges that I was extremely impressed with. Uh, last time we did a lovely. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I'm having yes. great. Yeah, um, we had a really wonderful workshop uh, on the elephant in the studio, uh, and uh, it it really made me, uh, you know, it it really made me remember the students that used to come to the University of Hyderabad from Trishur and from Trivandrum and the kind of uh, caliber of the students and how they already knew a lot of art history and so on. So it's, it's been a wonderful uh, introduction. And I also know Manoj and Bhagat from, uh, who Bhagat was my former student. So we we have, a, in a way, a long connection with Trishur. Uh, so today's talk will be basically an introduction to visual culture. Uh, visual culture being actually a sort of new and uh, you know an unusual combination of uh, various disciplines of what we call an interdiscipline or a multidiscipline and visual culture itself is slightly different from art history though they overlap on a whole uh, bunch of issues so today's um, today's introduction will be basically staking out the territory of visual culture. So I kind of introduce visual culture as a separate interdiscipline from art history and kind of give you an indication of the the kind of concerns, the concepts, the frameworks within which visual culture works. In the next session, that is day after tomorrow, we'll be doing a little more. We'll be applying some of the uh, theoretical frameworks very, very briefly. We'll be applying some of the theoretical frameworks to specific visuals that are both from the past and in, and uh, circulating in the public domain or in, in media and so on today. Because we are bombarded with images. This is a world full of images. And especially with other kinds of contact being cut off by the pandemic, 
we are living in practically a continuous visual world i mean we're always looking at things we're looking browsing on the net we're looking at our phones so the visual has become overwhelmingly important and also uh, politically also and ideologically it's really important for artists to know how to how the visual manipulates you and how to manipulate the visual so this is something i hope to be able to kind of introduce it's a huge will have done it so well but i'm hoping to be able to give my angle on it and uh, though i am an art historian and my area is uh, medieval art history i'm very interested in theoretical frameworks that relate to art history because my phd was on historiography on how people write art history and so uh, visual culture is very much uh, within my kind of mental horizon i i keep thinking of okay what how would visual culture handle this would visual culture be able to handle this you know so that it's always something that i juggle with so uh, let's plunge right away into uh, my slide show and the lecture So this is just introduction to visual culture. Um, I would like you to take a just as a as a kind of fun introduction. Take a look at the uh, image on the left. It's from a popular calendar art poster which I picked off the streets of Hyderabad, and the writing is in Telugu. Uh, what uh, it does is it's a drishti boma. Can you you can see that there are all the elements of a drishti boma here as a uh skull and crossbones on his forehead quite quite fancy which is you know uh it's it's a comp it's a kind of uh, a hybrid image with a little bit of uh, western art it also has a fruit shape like the pumpkin or the gourd that is used as as for drishti pariharam and you can see that it's got two scorpions on its ears and so on so it's a fa fascinating image uh which we find on the streets uh around us on new constructions on new buildings and it's very much part of a very ancient concept that is common to a whole lot of uh asia africa um and probably even europe at one point in time the notion of drishti the, the notion of the evil eye the notion of the nazar yeah so just think about the notion of nazar and what it entails and contrast it with the notion of darshan because that has also been talked about a lot in visual culture the notion of having darshan of a god okay uh, or this particular thing of the evil eye so one being a kind of good eye the a good reciprocal eye and the nazar or the darsh, uh, or the drishti being the evil eye so just keep this in mind um, as something you can think about later and let's move on to this very controversial work of art so why are we starting with a work of art because i want to introduce you largely to the differences between art history and visual culture studies okay as two separate but related disciplines and visual culture studies cannot be called a single discipline it's actually an interdisciplinary it's still it's still a mishmash of multiple disciplines and why these two actually have to be separated slightly on a theoretical level and what are they doing that's different from each other so let's start with a very famous work by edward mane the impressionist artist olympia now mane's olympia actually comes from a very long tradition of uh, painting reclining nudes we can trace it all the way back to ancient greece um and it experienced a revival in the renaissance because you know for about a 1000 1200 300 years the nude was not accepted in in christian europe it was considered uh, you know taboo but it made a huge revival in the renaissance period uh with the inclusion of with an in extreme interest in uh, greco roman art greco roman mythology and so on so the nude itself uh in western art is not 
a novelty at all. It's it's uh, very much part of an old tradition, and this reclining nude bears a direct connection with uh, Titian's Venus of Urbino. I'm sorry, the slide is not too great, but you all must be familiar with this work already. A famous Renaissance work called uh, Venus of Urbino, done by Titian for the Duke of Urbino. This is at the beginning of the 16th cent 16th century. So Manet's Olympia is part of a very long tradition of uh, reclining nude women, uh, usually in an interior space, usually sometimes in an exterior space, but usually in a bedroom. Uh, and the reason why it was exhibited in the Salon of uh, 1865. Okay, I think he painted it a couple of years earlier and he exhibited it in the uh, Parisian Salon of 1865. Now, what would art history have to say about this particular work? It would recognize that Manet was a very important, uh, a very important impressionist artist and uh, that he exhibited, of course, everyone knows this because it created a furor. He exhibited this work in 1865 and it created a huge furor. It would go on to say, art history would go on to say that this specific uh, painting is again part of an old tradition of reclining nudes and the one thing that uh, Manet has done for example is he has flattened the the composition uh, in such a way that it continues to reflect Titian's Venus of Urbino that's an obvious reference for him okay and also Francisco Goya's Naked Maya these are obvious references for uh, Titian uh, for Manet but what the painting does is quite a different thing altogether. For example, the gaze of the of the Olympia. It's not not Venus, but Olympia, right? And she looks at us very directly. Unlike most of the Venuses that we see in, um, you know, in the Naked Maya anger, there's no sidelong glance. And you can also see that he has extremely changed the way oil painting is handled. This is also oil on canvas, but the way oil painting has been handled has been changed quite, quite drastically. Even though the compositional elements remain similar, you can see that the depth the depth of the uh, setting has been shortened narrowly. It's an extremely uh, the lighting is not evocative. You know, the lighting here is so evocative. It's it's uh, unilateral lighting, and it's softening the contours. It's kind of uh, uh, it's blurring the edges a bit, like Leonardo da Vinci's Fumato. And generally, you get a sense of uh, the beauty of the location and uh, the lusciousness of the the bed itself and all the materials that are symbolized. And you get a sense of a depth of the room and a window beyond that looks into a kind of uh, interesting horizon. You also have elements of the dog, um, which is sleeping on the bed. And you have uh, the maids of the, this Venus. We don't know whether she, is, uh, whether she refers to a specific person or not. But this Venus is definitely a reference to Greek mythology. Like I told you, there's a huge revival of Greek mythology at that point in time. And uh, you can see that she also represents the bride because this is a gift Venus of Urbino to his bride, uh, Duke of Urbino to his bride, uh, his young bride. So there was a huge age gap between them. And he gave this as a, it's a strange gift that if we think about it. So here is. Uh, the Venus sleeping like a bride on her bed, sort of evocative. And behind her is uh, a maid and a young helper who are arranging her dowry box. So this is generally what art history would tell you. And it would tell you about how Titian used color and how, sorry, this is actually a takeoff on that. And it changes many of the elements, including the fact that you have a cat and uh, where there you had a dog. The dogs traditionally symbolizes, in the Western context, it uh, it's, uh, symbolizes fidelity or marital loyalty. That is, a dog is always loyal to its master. So it kind of indicates that the couple should be loyal to each other. Whereas here, Mane has replaced it with a kind of scary cat. 
a very frightening looking cat. And you can see that the obviously white maid uh, has been replaced by an African woman, a woman of African origin. You know that this is 1865, so when we look at the date, we can immediately see that. It's from that lady is probably from Algeria or one of the French uh, colonies in Africa. And she is bringing a bouquet to show to Olympia. Now, this is not a Venus. In spite of the fact that it borrows many of the gen genres of Venus, Manet calls it Olympian. Why does he do that? So it's basically, Olympians are the gods, the 12 gods on the Mount, Mount Olympus, the Greek gods. But this is not any specific. Aphrodite is one of the goddesses of Olymp one of the Olympians. But this is not some kind of Venus. This is a very well known person in, in Paris of that point in time. Uh, her name is Victorine Muron, and she was a model and a struggling artist herself. She come, belongs to a working class society. Uh, and she herself was a struggling model. And uh, I mean, she was a struggling uh, artist, trying to be an artist, but she was basically doing a lot of modeling for artists of that uh, point in time. And therefore, um, Mane had interactions with her, and he painted her. So this is where art history kind of slips into visual culture. Visual culture has some very interesting things to say about this particular painting. For example, T.J. Clark has talked about her class position, the very fact that she's, uh, she's a specific person and that she is posed naked. And this is clearly a scene of a brothel. It, she is a courtesan, a prostitute, uh, a well-known uh, person, social figure, woman of the streets in Paris. And not a respectable woman at home you know not not a respectable housewife or a, a wife of a man but a woman of the streets who were available to those men and she was definitely part of the underbelly of paris the nightlife of paris the the kind of life that is not talked about which is not really respectable but it on the, at the same time is extremely vibrant And the person who could be uh, somebody who's working at the brothel, or maybe the madam of the brothel, and she's bringing a, a bouquet of flowers, probably from a client. Okay, And so this, in some sense, in a shocking way, completely subverts the long tradition of golden Venuses. Venuses have always been a respectable tradition in Western art. Uh, Griselda Pollock goes on to tell you about the background of this and why it created a hero. Everyone says, oh, it's a nude. It's, it's like, uh, like art history says, it's a nude. The pic picture is very flattened. It's very uh, strange. She's got one, one shoe on one foot and she's got something around her neck and therefore it's not a full nude. And th so there are many elements which are not very typically, um, you know, related to the nude in Western art. But uh, like of the typical golden age Venus. It doesn't uh, link it directly to mythology. But actually, the problem is something social. It lies in the social realm. What shocked people about this particular painting, though they've seen so many nudes, was not its composition, was not the fact that the uh, cat had replaced the dog, not the fact that she had one foot, uh, a slipper on one foot, which usually uh, is an indication of sexuality it's a kind of signal of women's sexuality it's none of those things it's actually the fact that this particular painting was a known person it was not an anonymous beautiful woman but a known woman who's who is a prostitute uh, who is actually uh, you know been with many of the gentlemen of paris at that point in time and the gentlemen themselves had double lives they had a life which was uh, private and or it was public in a way that their wives couldn't access. You know, their wives and children could not access that world, which was a man's world. It was the man, a world of the flanner, the man of the uh, man about town go around, and he could avail of somebody like this. So how amazing it would be for uh, the wife and children of a man uh, who has just slept with uh, Victorine Moron to see her painted like this and displayed in the salon. The salon was a very family event. So that was the 
crux of the furor that it created. Okay, and uh, there were many criticisms about the aesthetics of the form, but actually it was not an aesthetic problem. It was a social problem. So it is about reception. How can your own wife see the woman you slept with, your mistress? The previous, uh, it's, it's like unheard of. And this is clearly reflective of the double standards of Paris in uh, the 19th century. The women didn't have access to this world. Women, respectable women, didn't have access to this world. And women of the streets were isolated from respectable women. So this is what visual culture will tell you. This is more of a visual culture analysis. And uh, art history doesn't go so far because it does ask questions about um, date, provenance, who's the artist, a little bit of the biography of the artist, the iconography of the sculpture, how it relates to Venus, uh, Venus of Urbino, and uh, you know the formal characteristics, how the composition has been divided, the brush strokes, the painting, the technique, the material that's used. And um, to a certain extent, uh, it's public, um, you know, it's uh, public acceptance or rejection. Those things would be marginal to the major issues of of art history, like aesthetic appreciation and iconography. So you can see already that there is a slight difference between the frame that visual culture is interested in and the frame that art history is interested in. Now, when we look at <clears throat> why is, so you can see that here again is another reclining women from calendar art. So why is visual culture different from art history? Is it different at all? And in, in which case, is there, sorry. Uh, Manoj, is there any way that I can get some of the faces on as well? Hello, can you hear me? Ma'am, uh, what you asked? Yeah, one second. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Is there any way I can get the faces on at in Google Meet because I've only used Zoom? Can I get any of your faces? Hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, think, how how do I do that? I think. Uh, No, I didn't How get do it I do actually. I, I mean, the. Uh, do you mean uh, someone have to uh, this thing um, open their camera? With... Okay, no, because I'm not getting any faces at all, and I'm just talking to a dot on my screen. That's <laughs> yeah. Weird. No, I, I think in between few few of our students can, like you know. Open their camera and ask. Otherwise, yeah, this, this should be no. But I'm not one-sided. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'll continue. With this. Okay. So, is visual culture studies different from art history? Now, let's look at what the difference is. Before going on to explain what the difference is specifically, I'll tell you what visual culture actually is. Visual culture studies. Okay. So, visual culture studies is the proper name for this particular interdiscipline, since we're talking about a theoretical frame. OK, uh, sometimes it's called visual studies and sometimes the discipline itself is called visual culture. OK, uh, so don't get confused when I'm talking about visual culture, I usually mean the discipline at this point in time. Right now, I'll refer to it as visual culture studies. Discipline uh, emerged in the 1990s as an interdiscipline. OK, that is generally with some combination of cultural studies. So it originated from cultural studies. And cultural studies was a very important phenomenon in the late, starting in the late 60s, 70s, 80s. And it dealt with all kinds of cultural phenomena, including pulp fiction, birthday cards, uh, you know, uh, movies, popular movies, romance, literature, magazines, comic books, and so on. So it was dealing with a whole range of popular cultural phenomena, unlike uh, some of the, and it, you, it originated in literary studies. So literature, uh, study of literature would generally mean looking at Shakespeare and Wordsworth and all the literary figures. But cultural studies expanded that field to look at popular productions as well. And uh, it was uh, obviously the background of it was a kind of socialist uh, Marxist background. And uh, 
visual culture studies is a breakaway from cultural studies in the 1990s, which says that, OK, uh, cultural studies, because it's based in, lit, uh, lit, in literary uh, studies, you know, it originates from literary studies, it doesn't have the capability of dealing with a specific phenomenon called visual culture. Visual culture is much more uh, complicated than most literary studies people can handle, and it's a specialized field. So it's a kind of breakaway group from cultural studies. And it includes, of course, art history, because many of the first visual culture people were actually art historians. Uh, it includes a lot of critical theory, uh, philosophy, anthropology, by focusing on aspects of culture that rely on visual images. So it's not enough to use your knowledge of literature or uh, you know, music or something of that sort, uh, or a general understanding of culture to understand visual culture. You need a training in the visual. Okay, so that, that was the reason why it broke away as a specialized field. And it also depends uh, a lot on, it has taken a lot of inputs from film theory, media studies, performance studies, psychoanalysis, semiotics, and so on, and a whole bunch of new fields, including remote sensing and, uh, you know, uh, microscopy. All those have been uh, inducted into uh, visual culture. So visual culture is usually uh, visual literacy or visual studies plus something else, you know? So depending on the strengths of the person who's doing visual culture studies, they can include one or the element. It's still very fluid, very fluid, the boundaries of visual culture studies. And the field definitely expanded the object field of art history, including a whole number of uh, all kinds of primarily visual artifacts. So it doesn't have to be artworks. Art history is mostly about artworks. Yeah. This included a whole bunch of other visual artifacts. However, the primary object of visual culture is not the visual object itself, but visuality. So art history deals primarily with the visual object and specifically the art object. But in the case of visual culture, visual culture deals with something called visuality. Don't worry, I will explain that in the next uh, this thing because we will, we will have to understand visuality in a kind of dialogic fashion. That is the social construction of vision. Some of the favorite uh, themes of visual culture that is the kind of constructs that visual culture tries to uh, use as its framework for understanding the visual uh, include uh, theoretical constructs like the gaze, voyeurism, surveillance, scopic regimes, ocular centrism, and so on. So what exactly is visuality? Since that is like the central issue of visual culture, what exactly is visuality? This is a very famous quote by uh, an important art historian turned visual uh, cultural studies person called Norman Bryson. He says, between the subject and the world is inserted an entire sum of discourses which makes up visuality. That cultural construct that makes visuality different from vision, the notion of unmediated visual experience. So vision, uh, we generally say vision is something like a biological experience yeah uh, it's a kind of uh, there's a certain biological commonality between your the architecture of your retina and my retina your eye and my eye so what you see and i see as far as uh, just scientifically speaking would be probably similar your notion of green your registering of green or moving shapes or some something against a dark background or even a recognition would be similar to mine at a basic level yeah uh, because with other species, it would be different. But we imagine that the human species has similar, all of us have are bound by a similar kind of sense perception, which includes the visual. So that would, the biological aspect would be called vision. What you see is what I see. But is it truly so? Do you really see what I see? Because between, uh, you know, the sight that registers on the retina and the brain which processes it, is actually, just think of it symbolically, is actually a screen. Yeah, it's a screen that I'm using a metaphor. Please don't take it literally. This is a screen that actually Dura's uh, famous picture. So imagine that this is the subject. And this is the world or the object that the is looking at he's not looking unmediated there is something that in the retina so what that what specifically is that think of it as a kind of screen in your brain 
even though biologically the same uh, Im similar image is on our retina, by the time it goes to our brain, what you make of the visual and what I make of the, the visual will be totally different because of our different cultural experiences. Personal and cultural experiences very much change how I see somebody or you see somebody, how I see a vision, what I interpret it as, and what you see. So this is basically the filter that happens. And that filter is a social construct. The filter is cultural. It's social. Okay, It's not so much. There's some element of individual in it. But it's largely cultural. Now take a look at this image. Okay, All of them are ideal beauties from three different cultures. Okay, All of them are ideal, beautiful women. This is one of the places where visual culture is most obvious in its in the way it performs, right? Uh, the whole notion of multiple different cultures, different people from different communities have different visual cultures. They're part of different visual cultures. So an ideal beauty on the left side, this would be from, say, Jan Van Eyck's period. From, uh, so it's from the Gelt altarpiece. It's Eve. And you can see how uh, the female beauty is shown as somebody who's uh, kind of slender, shouldered, pear-shaped with rather um, you know, long, elongated limbs and very little muscle or sinew, but the most prominent feature being the bulging pear-shaped belly. So this is considered, this is, she's not pregnant, she's not uh, you know, malformed, but she, this is considered the ideal of beauty in 15th century um, Netherlands. Okay. If you take the central figure, you can all immediately recognize it as uh, an Egyptian goddess. She's Isis. You can see how con such a great contrast between what is an ideal Netherlandish beauty and what is an ideal goddess from ancient Egypt. Uh, absolutely uh, slim waisted, and the breasts are usually shown when you look at the sculpture. They're shown very, very tiny, like a small, uh, like a uh, teenager's breasts, and hips are not much emphasized. On the right, you see the Madanika from Belur, from Hoysala period. Um, this is from Belur, so it's the 12th century. And you can see a completely different ideal of beauty, pot-like breasts, pinched waist, expanding hips, and a certain uh, animated dancing posture, and a great deal of elegance in the jewelry and in like the fingers, the eyes, the a certain elegance that's given to it, which is a stylization. So you can see that all of them have access to women who look somewhat similar, maybe blonde, maybe a little taller, maybe a little shorter, maybe a little browner. But otherwise, there's not a huge variation in how women look, beautiful young women look across the world. And yet, and yet, the cultural filter through which the artist operates has given him a very clear indication of how this is the only way a beautiful woman looks. So if an Egyptian were to look at the Belur beauty, the Belur Madanika, they would be shocked. They would think that it was a very ugly woman and vice versa. So what is it that makes, well, biologically, we, women have only a certain range. What is it that makes the representation so across cultures so different and the even the notion of ideal beauty so completely different it's not just a matter of getting it wrong it's a matter there by the time it gets to the artist okay it is a cultural construct and that cultural construct is basically defined by the schema of the artist's own culture. Because if, uh, you know, if the uh, Belur artist uh, decided suddenly to, uh, to pay, do a very realistic, so-called realistic Renaissance or uh, photographic realism kind of Madanika, he, it would not be accepted because people are used to this. So basically, the aesthetics of this, the stylization, the conventionalization, the way in which this is executed, as a representation of a beautiful woman is really what his society provides him. His society is what is providing him the screen through which he visualizes and executes the beautiful woman. Okay, so it's not just visualizing, it's also execution. 
that's the next step but we won't talk about it in this particular uh, session yeah so when we look at visual culture we know that visual culture when we talk of visual culture it's not the same as biological vision when you're talking of visuality we are talking of something different from biological vision so this is the social construction of vision it is that filter that exists between the retina and the brain which gives us a notion of what is beautiful what is not what is ideal what is desirable what is not and so on and so this visuality is specific culture specific it is not a universal phenomenon yeah and that and obviously that also follows that aesthetics is not a universal phenomenon aesthetics is definitely not universal it is definitely culture specific we can see how the aesthetics of uh, related to a beautiful woman is so different in different cultures yeah so for human beings to collectively organize orchestrate the visual experience together it is required that each submit uh, this is again price and i think that each submit his or her retinal experience to the socially agreed descriptions of the intelligible world so what what you're basically saying is that your retina and my retina may register the same thing biologically but then we kind of orchestrate our our understanding of what is beautiful via the cultural filter okay uh, so in remember uh, is culture continuity right it's the same 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 uh, social space from generation to generation so uh, this is agreed descriptions of an intelligible world vision is socialized and thereafter once you socialize vision it becomes visuality and thereafter the deviation from this social construction of visual reality can be measured named variously as a hallucination misrecognition or visual disturbance so if you see differently from what i do from what i see as a culture it can be ugly it can be a hallucination it can be a misrecognition it can be a visual disturbance so if the beyur artist was suddenly to create a uh, venus renaissance venus like image it would definitely be he would definitely be uh, considered mad or hallucinating in some way yeah that would not be acceptable so it's not just the artist but even our vision is constrained by the even what we consider beautiful is already socialized by the society or the community we live in artists of course have a much wider field of uh, of you know what is what they consider beautiful or not things that artists and art historians consider beautiful 90% of the world doesn't think is beautiful like a wise in face a wrinkled face you know uh, just a bit of uh, moss on the on the wall or something of like that not considered beautiful by normal people but artists and art historians are trained to see because we are exposed to a huge range of uh, uh, you know visuals from across the world and our uh, uh, you know our visual culture what that screen is actually much wider it's you know 70 mm or uh, it's a uh, imax it's not like the usual small uh, screen that most people normal people have because we are exposed to so much more and we look specifically at the visual and we kind of respond to the visual prom prominently so in some sense our our screen is imax and everyone else screen is like relatively small so visual culture is a social construction of vision and how do we know that take a look at this amazing um wall painting from ancient egypt this is nebamun hunting birds it's actually from a grave of this uh, nobleman this important person called nebamun and you can see that um, the many of the social conventions the conventions of egyptian relief sculpture and painting are operative here for example side face uh, side profile face front torso side legs you know the profile legs and so on but the other interesting aspects in, in include the fact that uh, i mean we can also talk about say there's no specific background the script which is a uh, superimposed you know the hieroglyphics are superimposed on what is obviously the sky and other kinds of painting and you can see that the foreground background has been only only kind of shaped by the fact that they're giving registers there's no sense of depth because you know uh, modeling overlapping those things are 
to a certain extent overlapping issues but modeling 3d modeling uh, perspective and all that has not been used so it's a kind of flattened picture and we only know foreground from middle ground from background uh, by looking at the registers that is the lowest level would be the foreground and also the basement of the picture the middle level would be the middle ground and uh, the top level would perhaps be the background depending on the interpretation but the more interesting thing about this is look at the figures next to nebamun on the right is his wife and at the bottom is his daughter now obviously the artist from our perspective is hallucinating how on earth can there be such an a strange uh relationship completely inhuman completely unnatural unless he married a pygmy somebody who was very small and uh, therefore they had a pygmy daughter but otherwise the proportion is unnatural for an ancient egyptian this would have been perfectly natural simply because we call this hierarchical proportion hierarchical proportion means the way you represent uh, a person in a picture or a sculpture or a painting or in any any form of art would be rel- would be sized according to their status and not according to their social status and not according to their actual uh, physical proportions so the relative smallness of the wife of nebamun is giving you a sense that she is socially less important than him and she is secondary and the ba- the child is obviously it's a girl child and it's obviously tiny and it's tertiary though she is like clinging on to her father clearly related to her father but she is of no consequence as far as the social status is concerned you also have to think about this uh, in terms of the way we consider children today we give so much importance to children right so in some sense a lot of facebook posts will be uh, of parents of young parents of fond parents will be broadcasting the children first i've seen so many facebook uh, you know uh, profile pictures which are actually people putting their children as their profile pics their own children yeah so uh, we the way we even think of childhood or child today is different from how the egyptian thinks of childhood and obviously how we uh, how the ancient egyptian thought of man or uh, or woman uh, was obviously different the same perspective would also apply across class if he was a pharaoh he would be shown much larger if he was a peasant he would be shown much smaller so this is called hierarchical proportion it is common to many many cultures of the world and one can almost without our arguing too much says say that these would probably exist more in a uh, non democratic highly feudal or hierarchical societies where societal hierarchies are so clearly distinct that you know that they actually are that they are the truth that pharaoh is bigger than normal people you know for them it's the reality so reality itself is mediated by this notion of status in society we are brought up and born and brought up in democratic society so we we find it a little strange but for the egyptian making these two the same size would be really strange so you see how this would be perfectly natural perfectly real for them okay now i'm saying this in terms of ancient egypt it's also there in indian culture but it's not that different even today this is supposed to be a democratic society but we still do the same thing if you look at uh, hoardings you can still see the same proportion operate this is ancient in uh, pallava period sculpture you can see the same proportion disproportion hierarchical proportion operates it's not natural proportion it's hierarchical proportion you can see shiva in the center um, and parvati on the side you can also see other elements like frontality and formality the shiva himself is much uh, given a greater importance this panel is soma skanda it's called sir uma skanda so you have uma parvati on the side shown kind of compromising shiva is man spreading he's sitting in the center and occupying all the space uh, women who traveled in the bus sitting next to a man might have experienced this and parvati is kind of adjusting and uh, she's also shown in short slightly smaller physical talama uh, because she is in this particular case slightly smaller than shiva and skanda is shown on tiny um which almost disproportionately tiny and on the right and the left this is the more political aspect of it you can see vishnu and brahma shown in much smaller talama 
just shown even smaller than Parvati. So you see, this is a perfectly natural and normal representation in the case of uh, in of ancient Indian art as well. This is Pallava period, let's say, say late seventh century, beginning of eighth century. We're not exactly absolutely sure of the date. Probably big, the late seventh century. So you can see hierarchical proportion very clearly works here as well. Hmm. There you go. So it's not possible to actually make a human being much bigger in a photograph. So what you do, you make a collage in such a way that the most important person becomes much larger and the smaller person becomes smaller. I'm not sure why my, um, why am I Visuality is the social concern, the notion of what we consider visual, appropriate, beautiful, and so on, is constructed socially. What you and I do it do is all that's socially. But let's think about the next step. Visual visuality and visual culture is not just the social construction of vision, but also the visual construction of the social. Now, this becomes a little problematic. Why is it problematic? Because it takes us to the next level of the ring and just don't concentrate on the screen and think of the goddess Lakshmi. Not because I'm being religious, just, just an idea. Think of the goddess Lakshmi. Shut your eyes. For a moment and think of the goddess Lakshmi. Okay. Does she look like does she look the, like the one on the left or the one on the right? Your understanding of Lakshmi. Does, did your mental image suit the one on the right or the one on the left more? Can one of you answer, please? Anybody would like to answer? It's right. Yeah, most most people would think immediately of in, and on the the one on the left is not even recognizable as Lakshmi, unless you go deep in and look at the two uh, elephants. In which case, you get a hint that it might be Lakshmi. Actually, if we if we talk of orig origins and originality, that's actually from ancient Buddhist stupa. Uh, I think it's Sanchi on the left, and it's obviously more ancient than the more obvious calendar art, which is derived from Ravi Orma on the right. So which is the original Lakshmi? Obviously, you and I haven't seen Lakshmi, um, or we'd not be doing fine arts and visual art. Uh, but if we had actually uh, seen Lakshmi, we would expect her to be like the one on the right. So in our imaginations itself, Lakshmi is already constructed. We haven't like we haven't encountered Lakshmi, but Lakshmi is considered constructed as much closer to the calendar art version of Lakshmi on the right and not so much like the very ancient, very original version of Lakshmi on the left. Yeah. If, if one is to argue for origins, if one is to say older is more original, then that would be the original Lakshmi. But that's not how we see Lakshmi. Okay. So this is very interesting how your society has constructed your vision. So, uh, and also, why are we... Sorry. So, Lakshmi is a is a kind of cultural entity. Neither of you has seen Lakshmi. It's it's a symbol of wealth and so on and so forth. So, the, your notion of Lakshmi, your cultural understanding of Lakshmi itself, has been changed by the uh, inputs that you've got from society. Now. Let's go to the next visualization. Shut your eyes and visualize for a minute. Visualize rape. Of late, it has been in the in the this thing, and all of us have kind of had a few nightmares about how it would have been for that Hathras victim. And you know, it's been very much in the news. So just try and visualize the idea of rape. Okay. And see if it matches this. 
this is how cultures portray rape. You may argue that Draupadi's Shiraran is not rape, but it is a, a, at least a prelude to rape, and the intention is clear. The one on the left is a Baroque painting of, uh, um, also of Susanna at the well. Two, this is for a biblical story of this pure, chaste person called Susanna who goes to the well to have a bath, and there are two dirty old men leering at her. And uh, then they accuse her of being, you know, a loose woman, and she has to prove her purity. The onus is always on the woman. This is a story of rape as well. Uh, till now, if uh, a woman is raped, whether or not she's respectable becomes, consent is not an issue, whether she's respectable, whether she's a good woman, actually becomes the most important issue for rape, uh, in a rape case. So as you can see, this is certainly, I'm sure most of you would not have visualized rape like this, right? And this is how Hindu movies also show rape. Uh, they show a door banging, the woman being dragged in, door banging. And then five minutes later, like there's some screaming and shouting. And then a few minutes later, she comes back with her hair unkempt and with her bindi smudged and so on. And her sari uh, palu kind of crumpled up. So that is considered uh, how you show rape. Can you see how rape, which is such a horrendous, uh, you know, uh, kind of tremendous mind body experience, which is like, uh, most depraved thing can be aestheticized. In a patriarchal society, rape can be aestheticized, it can be made beautiful. And uh, the women in these both in both these cases are clearly on display. So while they're being raped, you can you can say, oh, poor things they were raped, but you can also enjoy the fact that their bodies are so gorgeous, they're kind of fetishized, you can look at their breasts and you can look at their waist and enjoy it while you also say, oh, so sad Draupadi was, uh, you know, humiliated. So this is exactly <clears throat> what a patriarchal, misogynist visual culture gives you, whether it's 17th century Europe or 20th century Amarchitra Katha, uh, books that we give our children. This is, uh, this is, these are comic books that we actually show our children and uh, we expect them to get mythology from it. So you see how society constructs your vision of rape how it aestheticizes it, and how it makes rape acceptable, because it's pretty. So you see, it can actually, now we're getting into seriously um, difficult territory because of this specific thing that so, the, your, the visuals around you construct your brain. They even mess with your brain. They make you understand the world in a certain way, because society has given you visuals. Society has given you a visual notion of certain concepts, frames, elements, happenings, events, phenomena. And you are you are kind of framing the actual reality outside. You're mediating it through the frames that society is providing. So there is no such thing as unmediated notion of nature, woman, rape, or any of those things. It's already mediated through what society has given you as a frame. Yeah, we talked about how children, for example, were considered non-entities in, in like in Egyptian art, they were just, just a thing. But today we give children much more prominence. So even the notion of child is so different from different cultures. What we're trying to do with rape itself is to try and change society's notions of rape through the various rape laws and the activism that women do uh, to completely change this whole patriarchal notion of rape. On one hand, it's a face rate worse than that because, why? Because it it's like it uh, humiliates the woman because it finishes the woman. She she doesn't exist anymore after rape. But that's, that's the whole thing that we're trying to reverse, right? We're trying to reverse the dialogue, saying that the perpetrator is the person who should be blamed for rape and not the victim. Yeah? Victim blaming is part of, very much part of, patriarchal culture's understanding of rape. And so you can aestheticize it and you can blame the victim. How convenient. So this is what, this this is the kind of visual that makes rape acceptable. Okay, and it has for centuries in many cultures. Now, what is the next thing I want you to think of? Afghanistan. Yeah, think of Afghanistan. Just close your eyes and think of Afghanistan. 
Okay, do you get this kind of vision of Afghanistan? Is this how you look at Afghanistan? It's a beautiful lake in the middle of uh, the Pamir plateaus, I think. Or is your vision of Afghanistan more like this? For me, this is how, unfortunately, I have begun to think of Afghanistan. Despite my art historical training. When I think of Afghanistan, I think of this. So my my whole understanding of a, of a concept like Afghanistan is already constructed by the media bombardment and the, the verbal bombardment and the TV channels about what they portray as Afghanistan. But there is also this. This is a, a, a remote tribe uh, in Kyrgyzstan, I think. And there's also this, the fabulous mosque, uh, the Blue Mosque in Herat. Who would have known all this is part of Afghanistan? All we see, all we think of when we think of Afghanistan is this. So you see how powerful the visual is. The visual is, is a kind of, there's so much visual around you that it even alters the understanding of reality that your brain constructs about certain uh, things that you're not in, in touch with or even things that you are every day in contact with. So what happens is the visual mediates your sense of the world or sense of reality. Okay, And that's a very, very important aspect. And that's exactly what artists need to know uh, which art history doesn't really give you an access to. It gives you a hint that this is possible, but it doesn't give you access to it in such a way that visual culture studies does. The very fact that your entire world is mediated by the visuals you re receive from the media and you know the bombardment of visuals that you receive, that even your brain is messed with by the visuals you have, that your your understanding of reality is completely distorted by is there a way of correcting the distortion not really okay there's there's no way of correcting the distortion but that doesn't mean that all distortions are equal uh, what artists do for example is to expand our field of the visual right we go around looking for other other forms of other frames for the visual and therefore some sense we try to move beyond that people in the arts do this all the time with the visual yeah so i hope you understand how visual uh, culture or visuality is not just the visual construction of the social uh, it's not just the social construction of vision it's not just that we see uh, you know uh, the king as larger and the people as smaller but also the visual construction of the social. So even a concept which is relatively abstract for me, like Afghanistan, because I've never been in, is constructed by the visual for me. So there's a reciprocal relationship between uh, my visual inputs, the stimuli that I get, and the social, uh, and, this, uh, and reality. And the, there's a kind of frame. The frame that is, stands between the two is actually the social, my cultural uh, you know, my cultural ethos, <clears throat> the things that I'm surrounded by. And there's no way that I can escape this mediation. I have to theorize my way out of it. I have to think it through. I have to, uh, you know, critique it. So that's where critical thinking comes. When I take that frame as for granted, it is true that society gives me a frame. It gives me a lens through which I'm looking at reality. And then I look at the lens for a minute and I critique it. And there are many ways of doing this. So when we're around talking about Afghanistan, take a look at this famous, we'll talk about another concept related to visual culture, which is the gaze. The gaze is a very, very important visual culture term. Uh, visuality is one. And visual culture studies also loves to talk about the gaze, which is basically derived from psychoanalysis. Uh, take a look at these two wonderful images, both of them absolutely stunning. Uh, on the left is Fermier's uh, girl with the blue turban. And on the right is the famous National Geographic Afghan girl, captured in the 1980s by uh, a photographer called Steve McCurry. And this was an Afghan refugee girl in a, in a camp. And, and uh, he took this and it came on the cover of National Geographic. And she became the kind of Asian Mona Lisa. She became so famously referred to as the 
Asian Mona Lisa. Now, what exactly are we talking about when we talk about the gaze? So the gaze is a concept that is borrowed from uh, psychoanalysis. So gaze, of course, exists in, in many, many cultures. Like we talked about Nazar and Drishti to begin with. That's one form of the gaze. Yeah. And uh, Darshan, that's another form of the gaze. Okay, so different cultures have different notions, but this specific, very modern notion of the gaze, which is part of visual culture analysis, derives largely from uh, Freudian and Lacanian psychoanalysis, later modified by feminist psychoanalysts like, um, like Julia Kristeva and so on. So many categories and classifications of the gaze exist. We talk of what this gaze, the averted gaze, like you remember Venus, Demi, uh, Venus of Urbino, she looked away coyly, so that was the averted gaze. And Olympia had the direct gaze. So you see uh, the way in which they kind of present to us, you know. The, and this gaze is usually a concept between human and human, or sometimes between animal and human, okay, or sometimes between artwork and human. So, but there's always an element of something that has an eye. So the averted gaze and the direct gaze are very much talked about in the context of, say, uh, Venus of Urbino and Olympia. The tourist gaze, that means I'm looking at something as a tourist. You remember that, uh, like, from the tsunami onwards, there's been something called disaster tourism of late, you know, when people come and look at uh, sites of earthquakes and so on. So the weird kind of tourism. Uh, so the tourist gaze... Uh, it changes. It could be a monument. It could be a disaster that you go around looking at. The bystander's gaze. The bystander is like the flanner's gaze. The bystander just stands by and does nothing about it. See, one of the things that you see is like if there is, a, you know, some altercation going on in my neighborhood, I stand and watch. Indians do that a lot. So that's a bystander's gaze. And un you're involved in it kind of emotionally, but you're not going to intervene. Okay, so there's a bystander's gaze. The male gaze which is the central issue of uh, the one of the people who, uh, one of the groups that actually brought the gaze into visual culture studies was the feminists and primarily the male gaze but now there are it has become a more complex issue of uh, gazes there are uh, because gender is you know on a spectrum and uh, so the male gaze has become i, I still iconic and it's the principle on which the other kinds of gazes are worked out. But then you can have so many other the queer gaze and so on. The colonial gaze, how the uh, the colonizer looks at brown-skinned people. So many paintings like of Delacroix and so on, of how uh, women in the Zen, in the harem are looked at by the colonial gaze. Yeah. So the look, these are other forms. These are not gaze. The look, the glance, the gaze, the stare, and so, so many other categories of looking at people okay so there are so many ways of looking and reci reciprocal looking yeah so there are always two sides to a gaze okay um on the one hand she is gazing at me on the other back on on the one hand i am gazing at her, okay so who am i in relation to looking at this, maybe an, uh, an I'm an art critic, maybe I'm an artist, maybe I'm somebody who's just looking at, um, you know, looking at magazines. Um, so who am I? Uh, maybe I'm I'm also a man or maybe a woman or, or maybe a young person, maybe a brown person. So all that is me, the subject, looking at the person who's gazing at me. And she gazes, both gazes, she gazes back. When you look at gazing back you can see on the left Vermeer's uh, girl with the blue turban she's just what is called a throny a lot of uh, there's a hollywood movie about it and all that but basically she's a type a type of person like in india we have types like uh, uh, you know the clown the joker um, the gana the bhuta gana uh, when we see a sculpture in uh, you know the ideal man the ideal woman in movies, you have the uh, the dark, short sidekick who makes silly jokes. You know, uh, very often in in Telugu movies, it's a Telangana guy. In Tamil movies, it's like um, you know, there are stereotypes of this person, the mother-in-law stereotype. So the, these are all types. You know, so on the left is also a type, the beautiful young girl type, 
uh, Throny in, in the case of T-R-O-N-I-E, in the case of uh, Dutch art. And it's sold as a very for popular form of the portrait. It's not something specific, but just young girl. And you can see that uh, he has used a live model, probably. And you can see that the gaze of the model also, when she's looking at us, is one of familiarity. So obviously, this girl was comfortable with the artist. And there's a certain vulnerability in the way she's opened her lips. Okay, And she gazes back uh, sidelong. You can see there's no alarm. She's kind of, you, you can see that it's a slightly indulgent, because a slight tilt of the head. A slightly indulgent gaze. It's not an averted gaze, not a direct gaze. It's neither of them. It's like a by the way gaze. No, she's just looking back at us, and uh, the artist is and she have a obviously have a rapport. They are comfortable with each other, and therefore he was able to capture uh, her beauty, not in a very startling way. On the right hand side, you see a very startling contrast between the one uh, away from the girl with the blue turban. You can see on the right that there is this obviously other. Okay, She's got torn clothes and uh, beautifully framed with blue and red too, like very classy non-European colors. And she's brown skin and unkempt hair, so that talks of poverty, which is also the other in some sense. Um, and you can see that her gaze is definitely a hostile one. It's hostile because she's reciprocating the photographer's hostility. Is it, her photographer is a is Steve McCurry, a white American, who has just barged into a, a a refugee camp and taken a photograph of this girl without her consent. So you can see that her pupils are contracted. It's so clear in this, and she's like uh, an animal caught in the headlights of the car, completely reluctant to uh, be part of this exchange and extremely hostile and extremely frightened. So you can see that there's a solid contrast in the reciprocity of the gaze. Otherwise, they're two beautiful women. OK, if you're just looking at them, they're two beautiful young girls. But when you look at the gaze, you understand that in this exchange, something very disturbing is happening. OK, so uh, there is a long story about um, the, the this Afghan girl, which continues all the way till recently when she was arrested and deported from Pakistan. So please follow it up on the on the internet. Uh, it's called the Afghan girl, featured on National Geographic and Steve McCurry. The the tragedy that follows is also is very poignant, and that actually tells us about why this picture on the right is very problematic politically. It is a picture without consent. It is a picture in a hostile environment and so on. And it's, it's, it, it has intersectional problems with it, multiple levels of um, why it's not, it's not a politically acceptable picture, even though it's a stunning visual. Okay, So it's very problematic. So you see, what the thing about the gaze is it has to be reciprocal, and it has to be equal. Even though she's looking back at the photographer, she's not equal to him. Even though her stay, her eyes are probably much more beautiful than her, uh, her eyes, her stare is much more. Why? Laka has this favorite story uh, when he went out fishing uh, with the people, uh, with the fishermen, local fishermen, in his late teens or early twenties, and. Uh, Jacques, the fisherman, says, no, who was it? Pierre. OK, one of the fishermen, the boat says, he catches sight of this uh, a tin can, which is glinting in the dark in the sea. OK, I've just got a random tin can. But he says, ha, ha, ha. He starts laughing. And the guy says, what, 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 what's going on? So you see that tin can that's glinting in the light? It's like catching the light. You can, you, you see that can? Do you see it? Then he laughs. Yeah, it, it turns back and says, it doesn't see you. Ha, ha, ha. So what's so great about this? Take a look at this image. This is Barbara Kruger's famous work. Your gaze hits the side of my face. And when you look at this image, you know that she cannot look back. One, she's a marble statue. So she can't. She doesn't have the benefit of being able to turn out, uh, turn back and look at you. 
she's immobile, she's inanimate. And the other, she's a woman. So there are two elements in this uh, particular image which poignantly point out that unless a gaze is reciprocated, you know, face to face, and not in all circumstances, that it is actually, the gaze can actually be an object of power. It can be a, a way of imposing your power that you're looking at. So you become the subject and they become the object and you gaze at them as if, you know, they are a worm in your salad or uh, an object, not like they're a person. And so you can have the intersubjective gaze, like the gaze between lovers or the gaze between equal people. You, you see that I'm just looking at gazing at this at dot on my screen. It's, it's this in, reciprocation is not happening, but I'm assuming it is. Yeah. Or it can be a gaze of power. Gaze is always a thing of power when it's not reciprocated equally. So this is an interesting thing that visual culture does. Voyeurism. Voyeurism is an illegitimate gaze. When you're looking at something and you are kind of creepily looking at you know, a woman changing or sexuality through uh, the keyhole of a door, you're doing a peeping tom number. Um, Edgar Degas has done many of these beautiful pastels uh, by, um, you know, of women changing. And there are always these kind of back views and clearly their keyhole views. Everyone praises, art history praises them as, oh, wonderful paintings. What a be beautiful painting. Look at the uh, use of pastels. Look at the cropped compositions and so on. But, you know, the, the feminists have talked about how this is an act of voyeurism. Women unaware of being watched when they're engaged in their private, uh, you know, daily routines. Somebody is, the artist is watching them and reproducing them. So even if they may be beautiful, it's a highly problematic image. So the activity of getting pleasure from secretly watching people in sexual situations or more generally from watching other people's private lives. For example, one of the commonest examples of voyeurism, clearly where one person has power and the other person is powerless, is all of you must have seen in India, when we go in a bus or something, like that, we see a road accident, the entire bus leans sidewards. Because everyone wants to see the road accident. Are they going to do anything about it? Can the road accident victim see back? No, we just get a pleasure in looking at the at, at their state of disarray. We want to know the human story behind it. And we see the blood dripping and all. And we move on. Yeah, so that is a kind of ghastly voyeurism, which is simply not okay. And a lot of voyeurism is also happening uh, on online where you know people uh, take for example i get very disturbed when people post images in, in the public domain like in facebook public uh, of their own children singing or dancing or something like that because i think oh gosh don't expose your children to random people looking at them because the world has become in such seamless in such a way that anyone can do this voyeurism you know so uh, even uh, pain, posting selfies i have a lot of reluctance to post selfies because it's a kind of, it, it uh, opens one up to voyeurism. And voyeurism is definitely a criminal act. It's legally a criminal act, but it's also an act of violence. You're looking illegitimately at something you're not supposed to be looking at. You're taking pleasure from something that's usually a source of privacy or of pain. So this is another concept that's very interesting. Susanna at the well that I've already shown you in the con context of the visual culture of rape, uh, the two versions of this, it's a very favorite theme, obviously, because it encourages voyeurism. Here you can see a pretty woman. It's a good excuse to show a pretty naked woman and two dirty old men looking at them. And the interesting thing about the dirty old men is that they're not threatening. So obviously, all these paintings are aimed at the male gaze. Okay, they aimed at a male viewer. Obviously, men have money. They've commissioned the paintings. And uh, it's basically to pander to their gaze. So seeing a beautiful woman in distress seems to be okay because you know the people who are actually commanding her attention at, at the moment are two very ugly old men who are not really competition for the person the male gazer the person uh, the man who's bought it probably a young man not like those dirty old men at the back so they're not really serious competition and you can see that 
Um, I'm going to tell you that one of them is done by a male artist and the other by a woman artist, both of more or less the same period. And you can think about which may be whose and why you think so. Just take a look at it. We're not discussing this, but just take a closer look at it and think about which you think might have been the women artist and what has been done in that painting uh, in order to sometime somewhat change the equation between the viewer, who is the basically the male viewer. Even if I'm a woman, I'm looking at it through the male gaze. I'm expected to. That's how the picture positions me. And you see how the image uh, is, is accessible to me as the male viewer. Okay, so we see which, according to access, you see which one may be male and which one may be female. Okay, so Laura Malvi says, in, uh, in a very famous landmark essay called Visual Pleasure and Narcissima, says that voyeurism, which he calls the male gaze, are foundational in Hollywood movies, very much foundational in Indian movies, to the extent that the male character always actively looks and the female character is passive as the object of attention. So here are the men leering at the woman. The woman is just averting their gaze. like they, they, She's pushing away their gaze and their physical presence. Okay, so she's, she's helpless and they have all the agency. She is like just defending and they are on the offensive. Okay, so this actually extends much further. John Berger has a fabulous statement about it as an opening statement in Ways of Seeing. The gaze, Malvi uh, argues, seeks to exercise power over its subject uh, or its object. As a maker of meaning, the male subject, either the leading man or the artist, or both. Okay, you can see that uh, many of the song and dance sequences in uh, like um, Indian movies, the woman is kind of dancing to the audience the male gaze in the audience and the hero is just standing behind her and making some uh, kind of futile moves but she is performing to the male in the audience even though there's a, the hero and the heroine are supposed to be deeply in love with each other so the male subject gazes at the female image and marks her as the bearer of guilt now there is one more more interesting theories i can't cover all of them in this particular talk ocular centrism that is the privileging of vision over other senses. It's not true of all commun all cultures. Many cultures have uh, privilege uh, the sense of hearing, you know, over or give them give hearing the equal status as uh, the visual, you know. And Western cultures specifically ocular centric. I see, therefore I believe, or seeing is believing. Show me. I have to see before I I understand. Okay, or uh, you know, isn't it obvious? Isn't it apparent? All these words are very visual words. So, ocular centrism is common to many cultures, but also specifically to Western culture. And a lot of things like medical diagnostics and uh, you know, uh, science itself is based on the fact that we are vision obsessed. We, the vision is privileged over all the other senses. So that is also an interesting topic in visual culture. We talk of scopic regimes, very interesting extension of, uh, you know, the notion of an ocular centric culture where different cultures have uh, different ways of seeing. Okay, John Burgess book himself is called Ways of Seeing, but we're talking more of even at the level of structure, as, at the pre-cognitive level. Uh, specific ways of seeing that are specifically manifestations of culture. We've already seen this in how see people, uh, different cultures see what is a beautiful woman. So here is an example of a scopic regime. On the left is, a, a, I think it's a Dutch artist, Netherlandish artist, anyway, it's a, a Western European artist, who, Madonna and Child uh, with angels. And on the right is a Mughal painter who has clearly taken the reference from this, probably from a woodcutter and engraving. And the scopic regime is completely different. What is prioritized on the left is de-emphasized de on the right. And what is emphasized on the right, for example, the carpet and uh, the delicacy of the lines and so on, is very much de-emphasized on the left, which is a better painting. We don't know. So it's just that when the Mughal artist translates, he's using this, the one on the left as a base, when he translates the Western painting, 
into the Mughal miniature. The translation puts him in a different scopic regime. He's already belonging to a different scopic regime, and that clearly comes out. I think. And the way he transforms what is already a very clear composition in Western art, Eros and Psyche. So you can see how it changes with his or using the same frame, using actually a, you know, a probably a mechanical reproduce, reproduction. Yeah. Can we stop now? Manoj? Hi, uh, yeah. Hello. Another five minutes? Yeah, Can yeah. I go on for another yeah, yeah, five sure, minutes? Sure, I just sure, want to continue. Sure, we have enough time, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is actually, uh, you can see what, what strange things have happened. Composition is clearly uh, borrowed. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, I yeah? hope the last few minutes was not clear, actually. The audio was uh, not clear, actually. I hope so. From when? From which uh, side? Uh, the last two From slides. From Scopic regions? The last two slides. You saw me here? This one was OK? Was the audio clear for this? Yeah, yeah. It is clear now. Yes, after this. After this. OK. No, the, this is just to say how Ravi Varma on the right has taken the composition um, and even the setting from uh, Eros and Psyche done by various Western artists and how the scopic regime to which he belongs to makes him change the entire feel of the picture, the gestalt of the picture, despite the fact that he's using the same medium, he's clearly borrowing the uh, uh, image just from what is topic as a way of composing a picture, a way of looking at the world has actually changed uh, in the picture on the right. Manoj, hello. Guys, can one of you come in and say whether you can hear me? Again, there was a problem, yeah, a little bit. It was not okay, let me just go on. Okay, is it sure. clear now? Yeah. Now it's clear. Yeah. yeah. Can one of you? Ma'am, it's breaking oh. again. Tell me if it goes off, okay? Uh, because the last and sketch collection of uh, calendar art, uh, you know, images, um, you can see that it has completely changed in so many ways to cater to a kind of uh, popular visual culture th uh, mentality in India, including uh, perfectly uh, done eyebrows and pink lips for all the characters and clarity. There's no one side light like you have in uh, very much part of Leonardo da Vinci. You can see that the sumato is gone for a toss and you have extremely clear outlines and so many interesting features, including what's kept on the table and the artist's own imagination of what lies below the table. OK, so if you think if you compare these. two, you realize what are the elements of the 20th century popular scopic regime in India? And the the compulsions of offset printing, like the calendar art, there's also the commercial angle to it, right? The, how it is, what is the medium of the production and how it is produced and who it is supposed to cater to. So you can see that this would be a popular version of Leonardo da Vinci in today's. Uh, so if you just separate out the elements, what, what has changed, you realize that we are operating, the artist and all of us are operating under a totally different scope equation. So just to sum up, how is art history different from visual culture studies? Obviously, they overlap. 
and artists and art historians are also doing both art history and visual culture studies we don't say okay now i am stopping to do art i'm stopping doing art history and i'm drawing a boundary and now i'm going to do visual culture so that's not how the way it operates but it's interesting to know what visual culture studies can add to art history as as a uh, and extend its field of operation okay so it extends the field of art history in, in many interesting ways so when art history looks at objects it looks at mostly what it frames as artworks the, the very reason why it's called art history is because it looks at artworks of course there are many exceptions to this for example we look at indus valley terracotta toys but because they're ancient we put them in an art you know we kind of con con conduct use them as a kind of artwork for a lot of uh, time uh, for a lot of period through, throughout the colonial period um, indian sculpture and architecture were con considered archaeological artifacts it was only the 1910 uh, to 1920 period that there was a huge challenge to that from the nationalist art historians like uh, eb havel kumar swami abanindra tagore who changed the notion of archaeological artifacts to artworks okay it was it was just borderline that but they made it artworks and we look at it through an art frame okay so but mostly art history looks at artworks and artists and biographies and context yeah whereas visual culture studies can look at anything visual you can see that i brought in a lot of calendar art most art history i mean traditional art history would say how can you look at calendar art that's not art there's nothing aesthetic about it it's kitsch yeah and the whole distinction between art and kitsch was very prominent in modernism but in vis visual culture studies loves objects of popular culture so anything visual even x rays even remote sensing photographs can actually be analyzed in uh, as part of visual culture studies okay obviously not just for themselves you have to see them in a context okay so artist is also more interested in the moment of origin so when i'm talking about leonardo da vinci's last supper i will talk about leonardo about um, uh, the renaissance europe early re uh, renaissance talk about milan about his patronage uh, so basically i'm also interested in what uh, how leonardo thought so i have a person out there an imaginary person called leonardo da vinci his psyche a lot of his writings remain so i'm interested mainly when i'm looking at the last supper i'm interested mainly at the moment of origin whereas visual culture culture studies would be more interested in the context of reception so how leonardo da vinci made that painting and what was his what was his visual culture what was the visual culture around him at that period would be as interesting for a visual culture studies person as it would be to understand how somebody in the 21st century goes to the louvre you know say an african you know from um, uh, sub saharan africa goes and looks at leonardo da vinci's last supper so that would be an equest, equally interesting topic as much as how leonardo painted the picture in what context he painted that picture how the people around him reacted to it how the people in 18th century reacted to it how we sitting in india react to uh, leonardo da vinci's uh, last supper all this would be part of visual culture studies analysis of last supper whereas art history would stick to a more point of origin kind of when it was made who made it that kind of thing okay so uh, the uh, conceptual categories of art history include form style aesthetics iconography provenance when was the painting made who who was it made for who was the patron and so on so on iconography what does it represent how is it aesthetics how is it beautiful what is the medium that's used and so on so these would be the categories that art history deals with whereas in visual culture studies you would deal with other categories like we've already talked about scopic regimes the gaze ocular centrism and so on so the conceptual framework what art history and visual culture studies they might be studying the same object but what they're making out of that object is extremely different yeah it's a bit like the six blind men and the elephant two different uh, completely different perspectives and art history generally it's not necessary but generally deals with artworks and frames even recent works like as if they were made in the past as if they have a history whereas uh, visual culture studies is best for working with contemporary phenomena popular culture recent phenomena and so on okay because the context is so important and in the case of past works we have lost a lot of the context so it doesn't it's less vigorous when it comes to dealing with something in the 16th century india or something like that so it cannot really handle those elements very well 
Whereas art history can, it has the tools to deal with it. Okay. So the most important difference between art history and visual culture studies, this is a philosophical difference, and I need you to you know pay attention to it carefully, is that art history generally, okay, it has a realist or objectivist perspective, and visual culture is fundamentally constructivist. Now I don't expect you to know what that means, but here is a my attempt at explaining what that means. So when you look at uh, different types of uh, theories about we understand the world. So objectivism or the realist perspective says basically that reality pre-exists. There is a certain reality that exists beforehand. Okay. And we as viewers, there are many variations of this. Okay? We as viewers or as people who are kind of encountering reality, kind of try and approximate. We have a direct access at reality. Okay, and of white noise, the bullshit, away little by little by little, and science progresses towards getting that reality. Okay? Visual culture study uh, generally... Could you, could, could you repeat it again? Now? Is, it, is the voice clear now? Hello? Yeah, ma'am, now it is clear. Okay, was it not clear? Okay, sorry, I'm so sorry. This is an important aspect. So the, uh, a major difference between art history and visual culture, I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself because I have no input, is epistemological, which is the structure of knowledge and how we can see, how we say that knowledge can be uh, created. How do people create knowledge? So that is basically a, um, an epistemological issue. Okay. How do we know some? Uh, what do we know, and how do we know it? That is an. Uh, those are primary epistemological questions at the level of philosophy. So uh, there is a mass massive difference between art history's epistemology. Most of art history, not all of it. Recently, it has changed a bit, and visual culture's epistemology. And we need to understand this difference. Art history has traditionally been realist or objectivist, and that means. Uh, like science, like a lot of things till the 19th century, we believe that the world, uh, a realist would believe that the world and its reality pre-exists the knower. That means I am knowing the world, but before me the world already exists as a reality. And if I am a real scientist or a real seeker or a real knower, I will slowly chip away all the noise in my head all the noise, uh, you know, all the white noise that's in my head or the biases that are blocking my vision and get closer and closer to reality because I have unmediated access to reality. The world is real. The natural world outside the physical world is real. And I can actually access it if I cut away the bullshit from my from my brain. Like if I slowly, I can slowly refine and refine and refine my approach and finally I'll come to the truth or to reality. Okay. So... Uh, the constructivist paradigms, which are uh, more of a more recent, but they're also very ancient. You have constructivist paradigms in, you know, in Buddhism and so on. Uh, it's a very interesting break away from the realism, uh, which basically says that the knower, the person who knows or is trying to get knowledge, does not have an unmediated created access to reality. Reality might exist. Whether it exists or not, we don't know. The world is real. The natural world is real. The physical world might be real or not real. The thing is, we never have direct access to it. We never have unmediated access to it. Okay? Our, our notion, our understanding of reality will always be mediated through our culture. 
through our society so even if i am conceiving the sun as some physical object there will be a filter that my society imposes on me and the only way i can access the sun is not as a pure sun out there in this uh, in the solar system but through the frames that my society provides me including science science is also a socially constructed paradigm so this is the difference between artistry as a realist or objectivist thing and visual culture as a constructivist thing because visual culture says our notion of understanding of the world our understanding of this thing is actually uh mediated by culture okay so you you've seen that we made the huge argument till now and that is one of the primary epistemological differences between artists artists you tell you what is there in the picture or what was there in the society that uh, the artist lived in and so on and so forth but visual culture will tell you how we know the picture and what are it will make you understand or conscious of the frames through which you are looking at the picture and that is why it's constructivist it doesn't believe that there is a reality called a painting or a world that the painting represents okay so it's actually a very complex issue i can't deal with it now in the subsequent uh, session we will be looking at visual codes how they are appropriated modified reproduced and we will also be looking at uh, and we'll also be looking at the rhetoric of the visual which is how the visual is expressive and it can change our mind including images like this okay so here are some interesting random websites which i just pulled out uh, for you to use as reference uh, i'll pass it on to manoj and he can pass it on to you so these are some interesting sources for visual culture yeah so john berger was not a visual culture person as such by that time the theory hadn't come in he was one of the important precursors of visual culture his ways of seeing is a very important proto visual culture text so that's it for today's session um can we go back okay thank you ma'am uh, if uh, anyone have yeah questions yeah can have a small session if uh, yeah i think probably and those are talking please come yeah some of you please come on uh, on the screen if you want to talk so i can have a look at your faces i've been looking at a dot on the screen till now since i don't have any feedback did this make any difference to your understanding of visual culture versus artistry some of the students was there a uh, clarity in that yeah please anybody Hi, ma'am. Uh, it's Bhagat. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Bhagat. Yeah. yeah. Nice to see you. Yeah, same. <laughs> uh, ma'am, and it's really interesting session, and I hope mm -hmm. these students have some kind of presentation to ask, or maybe in the uh, maybe in the language. If maybe you you experienced last time in the physics. We all mm -hmm. faced in the this kind of trouble in um, this pandemic session no? so this good uh, yeah. space is not worth much to share mm. in that sense so maybe the next session That's they good. will come forward to ask something more you can also ask in malayalam i can understand uh, a reasonable amount of simple malayalam yeah Yeah, so Hindi, Malayalam, Tamil, Kannada. Yeah. <laughs> any, any of the southern languages and Hindi and French. <laughs> Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, I'm Krishna Priya. Hi, Krishna Priya. Did I turn on my video? Yeah. Please do if you want to. I'm good with oh. sound too. Uh, I guess the network is a little tricky here, so I guess I'll stick to the audio. 
okay no problem yeah uh so i'm actually an art history student um okay. studying at uh, fine arts college in thrissur so um in fact today's presentation gave me a broader idea of what the visual studies aspect of my course would normally be looking into so that uh -huh. way the presentation was very helpful um okay. i do have a question uh -huh. uh so i wanted to know if an artist uh, should be held accountable for the visual uh -huh. construction of the social as you mentioned um and also given how it's very subjective when it comes uh -huh. to um, you know uh, the sum of discourse among the people yeah yeah it's a very interesting debate and it's a long standing debate as well you see it's uh, i've had this kind of this discussion with a, a number of my artist friends and i think it's a very important issue but at the same time it's not something that i can resolve for you right. it's something that you have to discover through your own work and your own interactions with people but okay. from my point of view my in my opinion uh because i'm a feminist i do believe that we are accountable for uh the kind of frames that we put out there in the public domain if we are if we are going to um if we are going to frame something in an irresponsible way then the onus is on uh you know it it it, it really is the onus is on us to change the representation to make apologies to make amends you know and uh, i think we have to be extremely responsible about um see the thing is we have people who are in the visual arts have a responsibility to um change the way uh, visual perceptions operate and as artists and people who are uh, art historians and people who they deal with very minor things no we are not we don't have the kind of social reach that say popular media have okay we can only make a small dent in this world of popular media all the more reason why we have a huge responsibility to uh, be critical i'm not saying to be moralistic but i'm saying to be critical of how we approach the visual how we analyze the visual and how we pre present new visuals to the world i really believe it's a huge responsibility but that could be because of my own bias you know i am kind of left of center and feminist and for me this is an old school feminist so for me this is really hugely important and i think in some sense the visual is a kind of mission for me to talk about the visual so even what i do by way of uh, talking about the visual like in today's class i have to be careful to be uh, not even slip up with a uh, certain unthinking ways of constructing what i'm talking about i mean that so makes absolute a, a huge responsibility since we are in the party. no i mean it makes absolute sense does that make yeah so since we are we can consider ourselves the missionaries of the visual and so we have a kind of not a moral vision but a a critical mission mm. to uh, to make the right choices and we are responsible for consequences right thank you so much ma'am well that uh, definitely um, yeah. you know gave me an idea yet again this whole thing is uh, but don't take sorry ma'am no don't take my word for yeah, it it's I only mean, my it's perspective subjective. it's a uh, very subjective so <laughs> that's understandable yes yeah and i found that more women ask this question in my experience than men do mm. that itself is indicative of something very interesting happening there right hello 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 yes. madam yes. hi manu i am yes. uh at uh, today my phone is not work uh, i have no phone now and that way i am yeah. joining yeah. from sangeetas i have a question it's how no this, uh, <laughs> this visual culture studies how they take this concepts of uh -huh. uh, abstraction and or uh, the uh, more abstract question how uh -huh. they confront with them they complete are they completely denying the or how they uh take all that abstract questions or you're talking of abstraction no, in art how, 
Are you talking of like no, no, Jackson no. Pollock? And... Uh, how the visual cultural studies, uh, the visual culturist, how they take this kind of uh, topics, how they deal with this kind of topic? Are they completely denying them, or which kind of topics? I can't understand. Uh, the, the... The Which topics, kind of the, the, topics uh, the art historians are concerned of. Like style and uh, iconography and all that? No, the aesthetic style. Aesthetic uh, style, yeah. iconography. Yeah, uh, style, iconography, aesthetics, uh, uh, provenance, all these would be art historical questions. And of course, they're not denying them. But the thing is, the, the emphasis, the focus is different. OK. So if you if you look at a visual uh, in terms of artistry plus visual culture, what you have is a largely expanded field, you know? Yeah. So uh, it's like it's like taking a much uh, like I said, the lens becomes rather larger from from uh, your mobile screen. You're looking at it on a large screen. Yeah. So you have a much larger background and stuff that comes into it and you have a much wider scope for exploring the visual. So there's a lot of overlap, but uh, so there's art history, then there's an overlap area, and then there's visual culture. So your screen becomes very panoramic. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes. OK. Any more questions? You please uh, do give me feedback uh, and questions, you know, by WhatsApp or uh, email, because I have no sense of whether what I said makes sense or not, because there's so little feedback. And this is not a problem I face in the classroom. No? I can immediately make out how people are responding to it, whether it's make, making sense or whether it's relevant at all. So there's just two or three questions that I wanted to ask if it is clear. And I, I want a couple of responses for that. Did you understand? Uh, I hope you understood the difference in some sense between art history and visual culture studies as two different disciplines with a lot of overlap. Even though they're in the same object, there's a lot of overlap. And you can't make a line and say this is this and this is that. But definitely, they're not dealing with the same frameworks. OK, the frameworks are different. I'm hoping that everybody understood how difference happens. And uh, also, ma'am, there is a question from uh, not a question, a message from Mr. Arun. Um, mm -hmm. He says, "I'm Arun. Uh, how emotional yeah. conditions play in visual construction in art, in your view?" Mm -hmm. uh, that's what he was asking. Okay. Uh... So as are you talking as an artist or as a viewer? Over to I don't I don't can and I don't can and you can yeah. Um uh, ma'am both as, Okay, uh, if it would have it would have I would have to answer, I would have it, to answer uh, it, yeah. it yeah from two different from perspectives. Two different perspectives. Uh, in presenting a new kind of visual without social and cultural construction uh, that mm -hmm. you said. Mm -hmm. um, um, as far as, as, I, far understand, as I understand, it's kind of, kind of uh, why are you getting an echo? Are you getting an echo? No. OK, this sounds so weird. Um, so I'm in an echo chamber. Uh, <laughs> so the, the, the reason why I think that this uh, this particular thing can be answered by visual culture studies. It's, it will tell you that even emotional conditions and the notion of the subjective, okay, is not, uh, you like to think of it as extremely individual and extremely personal and subjective, but it isn't so. Even such things as emotional conditions have something called a social foundation, yeah? And visual culture will not be inter inter interested in very specific uh, subjective influences. It could not really be in, in interested in, uh, you know, the subjective uh, feelings or 
you know emotional states of a, of an artist because that's not within its purview that would be more like psychology and so on it would be more interested in the the social framing of what is considered emotional okay for for example um, let me tell you about i mean why i'm talking of this constructivist perspective is puko has done the same as work on madness we all uh, have theories about what madness is or insanity and how in different cultures madness itself is conceptualized as different things for example in renes in the renaissance period in western culture madness was considered three separate things three separate causes of madness one was foolishness folly stupidity low iq and uh, i mean we call it low iq today but folly stupidity foolishness okay it could also be possession by a demon that is some or something has come and possessed you okay, from some external evil force has possessed you uh, like we have again in india and the third thing could be melancholia depression what we call depression today that could also make a person mad extreme sadness extreme sorrow continuous depression could make a person mad so these were the three causes of uh, madness and uh, there were many ways of dealing with it in the 17th century they started putting people in prison okay kind of uh, secluding them from society because that is a, they thought madness was a kind of an anti social thing so it was not good for society for to be a part of uh, you know this share a social space with mad people so they started putting them in lunatic asylums and you know locking them up and tying them up and putting them in dungeons and obviously in the 20th century that also changed uh we initially were as not just uh, dungeons where you chuck mad people but asylums where uh, or uh, hospitalized care for mad people and uh, today uh, we have um, the the pushes towards home care for even people who are mentally disturbed and we don't say mad anymore yeah mad is like just a pejorative term we say mentally disturbed personality disorders this that and this we have whole number of words to cover madness but we know that in some sense it's the same object and it changes from time to time so visual culture is not really interested in um, how uh, my brain is functioning within the scheme of madness whether i am mad or not but it's interested in how my society frames me as a mad person you understand i'm just giving you a, an example of how this could work so uh, my, my own mental disturbance would be something for me to check out with my psychologist or my psychiatrist with my therapist but uh, visual culture is not really interested in that but interested in a contextual understanding of you know my mental condition how society makes me so okay ma'am yeah i think mr lal k uh, he is a professor from college of fine arts trivandrum he yeah said uh, madam excellent presentation yeah. and then there's a question uh, history is mostly a yeah. uh, story of successful people or people of people in power question mark like the unsuccessful powerless mm -hmm. people and their mm -hmm. imagination and life there's a question mark yeah that's it yeah uh, that's easily understood uh, we know that 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 is what uh, the dominant grand narratives of history used to be and that has been seriously challenged in the last 50 years or so with um uh, marxist historiography begins it and uh, feminists queer historiographers uh, post colonialism so many uh, new inputs into history has started challenging the story of history as the story of victors okay and uh, definitely history is no longer a single linear uh, narrative it's uh, it's uh, polyvocal it has it's multivocal it has many locations and there are multiple stories sometimes contesting sometimes clashing yeah so uh, we also have very interesting uh, movements like writing micro histories the story of uh, you know a small artist stuck away in some corner who never made it to any big exhibition and so on of an artisan of um, a mill worker yeah the subaltern studies which talks of huge groups of people who history bypassed very important movement in india and uh, feminist history is basically uncovering a, a second second wave feminism 
did a huge amount of uncovering of uh, name of women artists who were generally erased not just forgotten but actually erased by uh, man centric history and the same thing is actually happening for queer histories uh, questioning erasures okay uh, because it's inconvenient for patriarchal society uh, a lot of subaltern history and recent dalit history is talking about people who are definitely uh, the stories that were never told because uh, history is hegemonic has always been hegemonic so another thing stories of uh, say dalit who uh, were historically important who changed their society but uh, they were never recognized for that simply because uh, hege uh, hegemonic histories have a way of bulldozing and flattening all those stories which exist so it's no longer uh, history is no longer a story of successful people it's it's a it's an arena of contest contestatory uh, politics and uh, a lot of people refuse to write history of successful people we have that as a kind of a general framework and we you know read between the lines and against the grain to unearth histories which of the lesser known less successful less power, powerful people my history my project for instance is is, uh, is my long term project for the last 5 years has been to look at artisans of ancient medieval uh, of uh, medieval south india so looking at artisans um, and making and actual projects of making so in some sense that is not talking of patrons who are the powerful people who write the inscriptions and we know all about them and how much money they gave but trying to unearth artists and artisans so very simple but very difficult project does that answer your question yeah you have right. covered it beautifully okay thank you guys don't feel that there are no wrong questions to ask i uh, in a classroom my classrooms are very noisy and very interactive so this is really strange talking to a the thing and there's no interaction at all so please don't feel that there's any wrong question or silly question there's no such thing any questions good so in the next session we will talk about uh, we will look specifically at many of the visuals the fascinating visuals that have um, come up popped up in the last year because we're all sitting in the pandemic and also some popular calendar art and so on so uh, is there anything specific you want me to deal with any idea area that because i've not fully constructed it i have accumulated some visuals which we can discuss from the visual culture frame so is there anything specific you'd like to discuss madam one more question i have yeah tell me money. how this wires yeah, become how this wireism becomes a uh, crime uh, how uh, what is the uh, basis of making it as a, a crime um different countries have different legal procedures you will have to look up uh, uh, indian kanun or you have to look up international law on wireism but okay. uh, there are the specific legal ways in which it can be identified there are specific uh, criteria from which just looking uh, like looking at a road accident cannot be a crime but uh, you know uh, there are there are people who have put uh, spy cameras in um changing rooms of you know emporia and stuff like that they can get um, they can get arrested for that and even things like in the west in germany i was there for like a year and there they will tell you can you hear me 
yes yes okay in uh, germany they will tell you if there is a surveillance camera okay there will be a definite notification that says uh you are under surveillance or you are uh, that there is surveillance surveillance camera because people consider it surveillance also kind of uh kind of voyeurism no? it can be a kind of voyeurism if it's done from not necessarily sexual but it's kind of in, it's a very invasive kind of watching somebody right in okay. india we don't have a sense of privacy so the question of surveillance doesn't come at the so question of voyeurism is very fluid so the, even the definition of privacy is very problematic in india yes yes yeah so uh, so it, it's a very slippery law and i don't know if it can be imposed in india and whether there have been any successful cases except obvious things like putting a sky cam spy camera in <clears throat> in a changing room those kind of things can get you arrested but i really don't know if there are any uh, i mean there have been any cases of you know borderline cases being criminalized or something it's very difficult law to impose in india because people's notion of privacy even is so and even this notion of consent you no know, photography and consent street photography everyone does street, street photography all all the time internationally the whole notion of consent is become so important it's almost impossible to do street photography anymore you know because with all this face identification and stuff like that so both surveillance and voyeurism are slippery areas in india even to recognize that you are being violated by somebody else's gaze we don't have a sense of privacy for that and lot of people will not accept that, that there's something wrong with it so from there it starts i don't know how the law deals with it okay ma'am thank you mm. <coughs> Hi Abul, how are you? Hi. Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I am fine. I am fine. Ma'am, uh, could you please elaborate about your present that project that is going on that uh, you are dealing with artisans of South India? Could you please explain? Yeah. So uh, I start started it off uh, as a kind of, and I finished my PhD thesis. I realized that there's almost no uh, information on artisans, you know, uh, in the history of. medieval sculpture and architecture so that's my area of specialization so and ra- more medieval south india than north because i have access to uh, locations here so there's hardly any uh, various people have evo- avoided talking about artisans not only because the material is um, not accessible in the sense that there's not a lot of artist inscriptions and so on that we can get from uh, locations but also because there's a general reluctance to talk about uh, artisans multiple reasons why this is so and partly because of our continuous class bias uh, a caste and class bias in <laughs> as art historians yeah so uh, that g- got me thinking about how would art history look like if it was talked uh, talked about from the point of view of making what if we don't talk of the history of art but the history of making so what would happen to the discipline so just a theoretical frame like that and i started off with looking at cave temples especially ellora trying to make a theoretical frame out of it and right now i'm working with hoysala artists i'm working at looking at uh, how hoysala artists um, are there's a huge amount of inscriptions on uh, it's one of the most uh, there are the most artist inscriptions in medieval south india are from the hoysala period and one of the int- intriguing questions is why were they obviously it was a matter of being allowed to why were they allowed to um uh, sign their names or put their names in in a way that other locations more or less don't do so and they're not only writing their names in many cases but they're also giving elaborate eulogies on themselves like uh, so uh, this uh, this paint this sculpture was made by um let's say malana who was the uh, scissors to the neck of other artisans or who was a thunderbolt to the mountain of artists or who was a rutting elephant to the um, the zanana or the seraglio of other artists so it's like crazy amount of self praise and eulogy which is exceptional in the hoysala period 
Okay, so I'm working on, it's fascinating how this pops out as a complete exception to the general rule of medieval art. So I'm looking at it from that point of view and also looking at technique, uh, chisel marks down to that level because uh, in many places we don't have uh, inscriptions, but we have to look at actual uh, remnants, traces of making in mm -hmm. the actual objects. It's at, 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 at present quite a mess. Okay. I'm looking at it from different perspectives. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So I think uh, almost questions are over. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, it's time to conclude. Uh, maybe <laughs> it's more than one hour. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. maybe hoping uh, for a wonderful session uh, day after tomorrow. Um, we are grateful to Dr. Thank okay. you so much. Okay. We are grateful to Dr. Sharda Natarajan. Uh, she has been uh, in a busy schedule of uh, her own research and uh, she was planning some field trip. In between, he offered uh, two sessions for us. So that is uh, really like, you know, it's a privilege to have you uh, for us. Uh, anyway, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, let's meet again. Uh, day after thank you. At 11 a.m. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. Okay, thanks everyone. And, and Manoj, can you please make it possible for questions to come in so I can address them at the beginning of the next? Sure, session. sure. I will. I will pass on this. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, you know, we can have a uh, thread in the WhatsApp group and then get back to you. Yeah, and I can. I can once you give it to give me the questions, okay. like condense them and give me the questions, then I can answer them at the beginning of the next. Session. All right. All right. Yeah. Simply because this interaction is so limited, right? And I yes. feel it's very awkward. Yeah. But that will know my classes are very interactive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was, <laughs> yeah, that used to be very super interactive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks, guys. See you uh, day after tomorrow. Yeah? Ma'am, and please come uh, physically to our college. As Definitely. You yeah. Definitely. No, I really, really enjoyed uh, the atmosphere in your college and I love the journey also. So I definitely come. Let's this pandemic settle down for uh, maybe a couple of months maximum. Yeah. And yeah, Thanks, I would be very privileged if you invite me. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, man. Thank you. Bye. Bye.